Our guest today is a, a, a regional director over a huge area on the map. You can see that out in uh, the lobby as you go toward the, toward the restrooms and new construction over here. You'll see a map that covers all of that area. And uh, he represents all of those countries and missionaries in all those countries. I just want you to give a warm New Hope welcome to our guest Omar who is coming to share and bring the word to us this morning. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Delight uh, for Pat and I to be here in Urbandale, Pastor Weaver, Pastor Jeff, and all of you. We look forward to this. I, I was here uh, at this church 20 years ago, I think, when we were meeting in the other building over here, so it's great to be back. And we love Pastor Weaver. He's served on our World Missions Board and I've gotten to interact with him over the past few years and just uh, love his heart and I love what he stands for. And um, just congratulations to this church on your heart for missions. It's really, really amazing. And i uh, love to see it. Glad to be here today with my wife, Pat. We drove up from Springfield yesterday and Pat doesn't always get to it. Uh, be with me on the weekends, but uh, we were able to drive here yesterday. So, Pat, just wave at everybody. I met Pat at the altar the night I got saved. That's, that's quite a gift, you know, you get eternal life and a wife. <laughs> one, one moment. <laughs> I was raised in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Uh, my parents were old order on mission until I was about nine years old. So that means we rode around horse and buggy, no car, no electricity, no phone, you know, modern conveniences uh, were out for us. Three bedrooms and a path. That's with a P, not a B. And uh, so, so when I was, uh, when I was 17, I was uh, quite a rebellious teenager. And an AG pastor from Houston, Texas, was invited to come to uh, our town and do a camp meeting for the Mennonites, of all things. Someone told me in the first service they're one-fourth Mennonite. I, I didn't tell them it's not an ethnicity or anything, you know, it's just a religion, so I don't know how, you, I don't know how you're a one-fourth Mennonite, but anyway, he came to... I thought that was great. I'll remember that. Uh, he came to do a camp meeting, and a lot of Mennonites got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And consequently, were excommunicated from their church. So they all got together and formed this, what was called New Life Fellowship. And, uh, and they invited him to come and be their pastor. So he did. And they started, because this was such a move of God and people being baptized in the Holy Spirit and young people being saved, young Amish, Mennonite, young people. He, they started out with a, with a revival meeting that went on for 13 weeks every night. And then the church was founded out of that. And then we went on for months and months, uh, revival meetings every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Well, somewhere in the early weeks of that 13-week revival, my sisters, uh, one's a year older, one's a year younger, went to the meetings and got baptized in the Holy Spirit. So they, they got after their rebellious teenage brother and got me to that service. And, uh, you know, I, I never heard of Pentecostals. I, I, didn't, I was raised Amish, Mennonite, never heard of Pentecostals, never been to a Pentecostal meeting. But this was like a deep south Pentecostal meeting. Does that speak to anybody? So what that means, my experience was, so this preacher, he was an evangelist, his name was Charles Taylor, and when he began preaching, he got really animated. And so he was he literally, it was an old camp meeting, and he was up and down the middle aisle and the side aisles, and he was pointing at people and spitting and sweating and shouting. And I, I just, you know, this was all foreign to me. So I, I was like, what have they done to make him so angry? 
I thought he was mad at everybody because why else would you like, you know, but in spite of all that, and it was very entertaining and shocking to me, but in spite of that, the Holy Spirit got a hold of my heart and I went to the altar at the altar call for salvation and I gave my heart to Jesus. And while I was up there praying through, uh, all these young people, and this was a revival among Amish and Mennonite young people primarily, and all these young people gathered around because they'd been praying for me to get saved. They knew me. So they're gathered around and they're praying for me. And just imagine this. So they're passionate and excited and some are saying, hold on, and some are saying, let go. And it's like <laughs> pushing down on me. And uh, <laughs> That is enough to make somebody schizophrenic. You don't know it. Let go, hold on, do it. But I finished praying, and literally I turned around, and standing right in front of me was Pat. I never met her before. My mind went from heavenly things to earthly things. <laughs> And I decided in that moment, that sacred moment of just getting saved, that I had to find out who this young lady was. That she was as beautiful as she is now. Well, she gets more beautiful every year. We're going to celebrate our 30th anniversary. Our, our, we're going to celebrate our 48th anniversary on March 30th. See, 30 did have a role in there. So, yeah. So, uh, two, nights later, two nights later, I... I uh, talked her into having a date with me and picked her up, took her to church, and we've been, we've been going strong ever since, right, Pat? Right. <laughs> that has little to do with my message, but I wanted you to know uh, something about Pat and me. So I'm going to speak to you today out of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30. Verses 1 to 25. I won't read the entire text because it's a long text. I'll summarize it for you and you can read it when you get home this afternoon. Or you can do what you always do and that's Google it while you're in church. <laughs> I know how it works these days, you know. So I want to pray. Lord, I do thank you for the opportunity to be here for Pat and I to just be with Pastor Weaver and Pastor Jeff and Gay and uh, others that we'll get to know and just to spend these moments together with the, with these folks here at, at the church in Urbandale. So I pray today, I know this is the beginning of the missions convention, and I pray that the words that I speak, the comments I make, uh, would, would open people's hearts to what you want to do through them to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that these would be uh, moments that you would, you would speak to us. And as Pat said this morning in the car as we were coming here and praying together that we're not here to play church. We're here to know and follow Jesus and to do his will and to be a part of your mission in the world. So I pray that you'd speak to us in these moments. This is a story of David who was off to war with his men and when they returned to their hometown of Ziklag, they discovered that the Amalekites had raided the town, burned the city to the ground and taken all of the women and children captive. It's a sad, sad story. So David sought the Lord and felt that he was to pursue them, the Amalekites, so he did. He selected 600 of his best men and he pursued them. And when they got as far as the Basor Ravine, 200 of the men were too exhausted to continue the pursuit. So they... They, those who continued on, lightened the load, left some of their, their things behind with those 200 men. The King James says those 200 stayed with the stuff. Don't you love that kind of language? This, there it is, stayed with the stuff. 
So David and his men pursued and overtook the Amalekites, defeated them soundly, and recovered everything they had plundered, including getting back all of their women and children uninjured. So when they returned to the Basor Ravine to divide the spoils of the battle, some of David's men did not want to share with those who had stayed behind because, quote, they did not go out with them. David's response, he was not happy. He declared that the share of the man who stayed with the supplies was to be the same as that of him who went down into the battle. And David made this a statute and an ordinance for all of Israel. So this is, a, this is an important premise here. Not everyone went to the front line to fight the battle. But everyone shared and shared alike in the rewards when the battle was won. So a couple points from this passage this morning. Number one, there was a clear mission. David had a, he got a word from the Lord that he was to pursue the Amalekites, overtake them, and rescue those who were taken. So he was clear what he was doing. He wasn't out just wandering around the desert and uh, doing whatever. He was very clear that he had a mandate and a mission from the Lord. It was clear. Stephen Covey uh, wrote a book entitled Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. And he, habit number two is begin with the end in mind. So when you set out to do something, it's important to know what you're going to achieve. Someone said... If you don't know where you're going, you get there every time. <laughs> Makes sense, doesn't it? So the importance of having a clear mission cannot be overstated. I love my GPS. It's so helpful. I, can't, I can remember the days when I was itinerating all over and I'd have a map and the church secretary would send me directions. You take this route to there and you turn right, and then I'd look at it on the map. And it was, it was a nightmare getting to where you're gonna go. Now, it's so easy, Jeff. You just get your GPS and you punch in your destination and you're ready to go. It tells you where to turn and when to turn and how far to go. And even, the new ones even have the speed limit and uh, how fast you can drive, the whole deal. It's just amazing. We, yesterday we came into town and so that we didn't get lost this morning and miss the first service, we decided we would find the church and make sure we know how to get from the hotel to the church. And so just punch it in and it tells you to come down and 86th Street and turn left on whatever and right on 7 and here's the church. I mean, just like that. Now, I call my GPS Kate. <laughs> I, I, have two sis, I have two living sisters. One is a year older, Kate. One is a year younger, Verna. So growing up, Kate, she just loved to tell me what to do. <laughs> like, we called her bossy. I still kid her about it. We, we have siblings day once a year. and We get together in Florida with my siblings just so we stay in touch because we're kind of scattered around it. And we tell stories about growing up. And Kate was bossy. So, you know, my GPS has a female voice. Always telling you what to do and where to go. Kate. I just named it Kate. I haven't told her that yet, but <laughs> probably one of these days in siblings week, we'll, we'll do it. So, as a church... Followers of Jesus Christ. What is our destination? It's heaven. But more precisely, I want to talk about Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, where the Bible gives us a clear picture of what's in our future. He says, There before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, 
people and language standing before the throne and in front of Jesus. And what were they doing? They were giving Jesus the glory due his name. So yeah, we're going to be in heaven, but you look a little bit past that and you see that we are going to be in heaven as a part of this multitude of people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. Amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. So I, I pastored in Vienna and I had a guy in the church. His name was Derek Van Rensburg. And he taught me how to do strategy. And he called it the gap theory. One of the approaches was a gap theory. So he, said, he taught us that when you do strategic thinking, you think about where do I want to be a year from now, five years from now, at the end of time, whatever. What is my destination? And then the second exercise is what is my current reality? Where am I now? What's, what's our reality? So I want to be there, but I'm here. And then the question is, how do I get from here to there? It's called the gap, the closing the gap. How do I close the gap between current reality and, and my final destination? So we see that the final destination is heaven standing before the throne of God, giving Jesus the glory to his name with this multitude from every tribe, nation, and tongue. And now I look at our current reality. Think about this. There are over 7,000 unreached people groups in the world. Unreached people group is a people with their own language, culture, ethnicity. Uh, they're somewhat normally isolated from the rest of the world. They have their own identity. And they're unreached in the sense that they don't have a church among them, uh, among them that is strong enough to evangelize the people without outside help. That's, a, that's an unreached people, OUPG. There are 7,500 groups like that in the world. 4,600 of, of them are in Eurasia. It, we have some magazines on the table in the back. I've, I failed to bring it up here. It has a map of Eurasia and it's a magazine with great information. But just in Eurasia, the region that Pat and I are responsible for, 4,600 Groups of people with their own language, culture, ethnicity, but not enough believers to evangelize that group without outside help. Think about that. The focus this, uh, during this missions convention here at Urbandale is India. 2,500 of those unreached people's groups, people groups are in India alone. 2,500. India's population is approaching 1.5 billion people. Population of the earth is approaching 8 billion, so 1.5 almost of them. Almost, almost a billion of them are Hindu, identify as Hindus. Of the Hindus, Buddhists, and Muslims in the world, 80% have never met a Christian. Never met a Christian. 42% of the world's population is outside of the reach of the gospel. Think about it. So we have this, we know, and it makes us joyful. It motivates us. To know that we're going to stand before Jesus. And, and there's going to be this multitude of people for every tribe, nation, and tongue. And we're going to give him glory. But when you think about how far we are from that reality, it's sobering. And it motivates us to think about how can we change that. So we have this clear mission and this clear mandate but we have our current reality the second thing I notice in this passage is Jesus is that David calls his men to action he calls them to action he, he selects 600 of his best men and he pursues So if we're going to close this gap, we're going to have to act. 
And it's going to take all of us. It's going to take, first of all, some people with boots on the ground. We, I looked at your list of missionaries that you support. You have an amazing list of people. We, we know all these people from Eurasia. And then over on the live dead side, almost all those are. We, man, I, when I think about, look at that list, and I think about what these people are doing. Some of them are in the, in the, in the Himalayan mountains of India. Some are in India's amazing cities. Teams of people that are determined to plant the church. There's this call to action. The Holy Spirit spoke to me a few years ago when I was speaking at, he impressed me when I was speaking in the chapel at Evangel University that there were young people in that audience that God was calling to missions. And then I got to thinking about that and, and I, I came to believe that there were young people in every church, not just young people, but there were people in every church that Jesus is calling to missions. So I want you to know when I stand up here this morning and I look out across this audience, I'm, I'm like thinking recruiting. I didn't say that earlier when Pastor Weaver was in the service, but I'm thinking recruiting, Jeff. I'm signing people up today. Because we need boots on the ground. We, listen, we're never going to close that gap unless, seriously, I'm not playing numbers lightly, unless we have hundreds and even thousands of new workers that will cross geographic, linguistic, cultural barriers and put their boots on the ground where the gospel has not been preached and where the church does not exist. We're not gonna close that gap. So I'm thankful for every person who has gone, but there are, there are hundreds and thousands more who need to go. We, we have this missionary couple, uh, Nolan and Cammie Sand, Nolan and Cammie, we're not doing last names. Nolan and Cammie were students at North Central University when Del Kingswriter came there. And Del Kingswriter, uh, Kingswriter was the founder of the Center for Ministry to Muslims. And he was dying of cancer. And this was one of his last speaking engagements. And he came there. And when he walked up to the pulpit, he didn't begin with his sermon. He, he began with, with the words, I'm dying. And he told about what was happening in his life. And he said, I'm here looking for someone to take my place. Because he knew he was going to die. And among all these, among other young people that day at North Central University in the chapel service, Nolan and Cammie Sanders walked to the front and they committed themselves to serve in missions. They served for years in India. Now they're serving Central Eurasia. I spoke at the Tennessee District Council a few years ago, and before I got up to speak, they had three missionary couples come to the front who were retiring and were not going to return to the field. And I felt the Lord impress me to ask who would take their place. And at the end of the service that night, we had uh, numbers of people who came to the front and said, I'll step in and take their place. And a few of those are still serving in Eurasia today. So maybe there's some of you here today who will answer that call to action to put boots on the ground. We're all engaged. Jesus calls all of us to engage in the Great Commission. But maybe there are some here today who will respond to that call to put boots on the ground. The third thing I notice here is I want to talk about those who stayed behind. 200 became too weary to continue, so they stayed with the stuff. 400 went on and achieved the mission on the front line. But everybody is not going to be on the front line. Amen? Everybody is not going to be in the front line. But God calls all of us to be engaged with the mission in an active way. So some are on the front line and others... Stay behind with the stuff. I was reading in Acts one day and I came across this 
verse in Acts chapter 9 where it talks about Paul fleeing from his enemies who were out to kill him. And so he went into the city of Damascus where his friends hid him. But the pressure kept mounting, it seems, until they knew he had to leave the city. So they cut a hole in the wall, put him in a basket, and with a rope lowered him to the ground outside the city wall. And Paul escaped with his life. One verse in Acts chapter 9. We know who Paul is. He left us half the New Testament. I mean, he took the gospel literally from being, from, from be, he took the, the gospel from being the, the belief of a small Jewish sect to where it became a worldwide religion. We know who Paul is and what he did, but what I'd like to know is what are the names of those rope holders? Who were those rope holders? Because without them, what would have happened to Paul? What might have happened to his ministry and to the Christian message? I don't know. But I do know that those rope holders were very significant in what happened in Paul's life. We don't know their name. I'd like to know what they did for a job, for an occupation. Who were there? Did they have families? Who were they? I don't know. But I know they were important. You have the English, you have the Bible in the English language today because of a man named William Tyndale. In the, 16, in the 1600s, he translated the scripture into the English language when it was illegal to have the Bible in English. Only the clergy had the Bible and then in Latin, which they did not speak well and therefore could not really communicate the heart of God through the scriptures. Tyndale spoke at a church in London one night and there was a businessman present by the name of Humphrey Monmouth. And Tyndale shared his vision to translate the scripture into English and this businessman, it resonated with him. And he said, I wanna be a part of that. So he became a sponsor. He, he got, he got uh, Tyndale out of England to the European mainland. He got him an apartment. He got him all the tools he needed to translate the scripture. He supported him with his, with his daily living expenses until during those years of his sponsorship, Tyndale succeeded in translating the Bible into the English language. Then Monmouth, he was a ship, he was a shipper. So he made his ships available and they packed those scriptures into the bottoms of barrels of flour, oil. They put them in airtight, waterproof containers and put them in barrels of wine and wrapped them in cloth and shipped hundreds of Bibles to Britain. They distributed those to little small bookshops that were owned by Christians distribute them from there out into little Bible studies where people gathered around for the first time and heard the scripture read in English, in the English language. And an amazing revival broke out in England. So Tyndale was, fi- they finally caught up with him and they burned him at the stake because what he did was illegal. His vision was, he said, I will put the scriptures in the hands of the common man until the boy that walks behind the plow knows as much as the man who stands behind the desk. And he achieved that vision. So when they put him to death, Monmouth, who had invested years of time and energy and risked his own life and family, and was in fact imprisoned for supporting Tyndale when they couldn't find Tyndale and he wouldn't disclose his location, they put him in prison. Spent years in prison. When he heard that Tyndale died, he lowered his head, tears coming down his cheeks, and he said, you did it. You did it. Then he lifted his head and he said, no, we did it. We did it. Because see, somehow he came to realize that 
as a businessman, making his ships and his money and his resources available was as important to mission achievement as the contribution Tyndale himself made. And he said, we did it. So it's not just Paul, it's the rope holders. It's not just Tyndale, it's Humphrey Monmouth. It's not just the missionary that's ordained or appointed or sent out. It's you, it's us, it's we. It doesn't get done unless people like you in Urbandale, Iowa, catch a vision. Ask the question, how does Jesus want me to engage? See, we did this thing for years called Eurasia Experience and we ran it, went around the churches and we basically created an environment that was like Eurasia and we wanted people to experience Eurasia who, who maybe couldn't go there. And at the end, we did this little, did this little talk and then we, we put a hat on the head of every man and a scarf on the head of every woman who was a part of the Eurasia Experience and we challenged them to take that hat and take that scarf and to go into their place of private prayer in the next few days, put the hat on or scarf on their head and ask Jesus how he wanted them to be involved in the Great Commission. And Jeff, for years, when we interviewed new missionaries and we'd ask them, what, what brought you to this place? Many of them would tell us that Eurasia experience in that moment of prayer was a part of what God was doing in their life. So I don't have a hat to put on your head or a scarf to put on your head. We did it one time at the Kentucky District Council and all the ladies had come to council having their nice hair all done up real nice and someone slapped a hat on her head and she got a little, got a little upset and she didn't come to missions, unfortunately. <laughs> but I don't have a hat or a scarf for you today, but I, I would challenge you, really, in, in these weeks of missions emphasis, would, would you go to your place of prayer? And would you have the courage to ask Jesus, what is my place in the Great Commission? Maybe you're not Tyndale, but you could be Monmouth. Maybe you're not Paul, but you could be a rope holder. I heard this story about a guy named Charlie Plum. I'll close with this. He, he, he flew fighter jets in the Vietnam War. After flying 75 missions, he was shot down and became a POW and was in captivity for years. When he was finally released, he came back to the United States and people wanted to hear his story, so he'd travel around and, and tell his story. And so one night after giving a speech, he, he, was in a, he was in a restaurant, I think it was in St. Louis, and some guy walked up to his table, stuck at his hand and said, you're Charlie Plum. Said, you flew fighter jets in Vietnam. You were shot down, spent years as a POW. And Plum looked at him and said, how, how do you know that? And the man said, I packed your parachute true story then he looked at him and said I guess it worked <laughs> Plum went back to his room that night and he couldn't sleep because he's thinking about this man he met and he's thinking he, he's, he's just a sailor and he, he's wondering how many times I walked past him on, on the kitty hawk and never even said good morning or said hi or said hello or acknowledged him because you see I, I was a fighter pilot and he was he was he was just a sailor. So I told that story at a, at a church in Columbus, Georgia called Evangel Temple and it's right by, uh, it's right by a military base, Fort, somebody might know, I can't remember now, Fort, ben, yeah, anyway, it doesn't matter, does it? The guy came up to me after the service, his name was Tim Seymour, stuck out his hand, tears, tears were coming down his face. He said, I'm Tim Seymour, and he said, I served on the Kitty Hawk. And then I, I, 
said, man, hang around a little bit because I was praying for people at the altar. Hang around a little bit. I want to hear your story. And he said, uh, yeah, he served on the Kitty Hawk. And he said, uh, when she was fully staffed, and they had just retired her, when she was fully staffed, he said, they had, a, they, they, they had 101 fighter jets on that carrier. And the pilots to fly missions with them. But he said there were 5,500 total staff on the ship. They were cooks and parachute packers and toilet cleaners and linen washers and deck sweepers and airplane mechanics and everything you can, everything you can imagine. They were just sailors, you see. The big dogs were the pilots because that's what it was all about. But that's what Charlie Plum recognized is without... Without the parachute packers, I'm not flying. I'm not, I'm not flying sorties and achieving missions. He recognized that. He couldn't sleep that night. He's thinking about it. And now, you can Google him when you get home this afternoon, Charlie Plum's story. Every time he speaks now, at the end, he wraps up and he says, who's packing your parachute? So for every one of us that's on the front line in India or Eurasia or wherever else in the world, it takes 5,500 people that are making that happen. And God wants you to be among them. He wants you to be significant among them. And you never know what that means unless you ask Jesus how, how he wants you, how he wants you to be engaged. While I'm chatting with Tim Seymour, a man by the name of Gruden comes up and he's a command, command sergeant major, senior enlisted non-commissioned officer, U.S. Army Infantry School. Now, when I, get, when I grow up, I want a title like that. <laughs> but here's what he tell you. He listened to our conversation. He was part of it. And in the end, he said, here's what they taught us. Here's what they taught us. Your proximity to the objective is not relevant to your importance toward achieving the mission. So when we all share the mission, whether we're boots on the ground in India or in the prayer closet in Urbandale, It's not relevant to the accomplishment of the mission. I hope in some way the Holy Spirit will convey to you this morning the significance of your place in achieving the mission. Amen.